you know, I, I thought, you know, the, the organizers are such a good thing. You know, first thing in the morning, you know, nice, nice day. Um, so we're going to see how, 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 what, what can I do about the early acid in, in the other spikes. So, a little bit about myself. So I'm probably the only Argentinian in the room. No, oh, one, fantastic. <laughs> from Objective C to Java because everybody was with Java. I never touched J2E, uh, thanks God, but I was really interested in something that somebody did, which was called Genie. And it was a distributed computing platform, um, and especially in Java spaces, and in memory distributed tuple space. Um, so uh, worked with that, worked with commercial implementations of that, and, and nowadays I'm doing error. Um, so as part of my career, I've been touching uh, many aspects of what we what we call at that point in time data mining is intelligence. It's called the data now. Uh, and I'm also an expert systems. So the only marketing slide in, in, in this presentation, this is our company. We found it in order to build some of the stuff that I'm going to show you today. Um, and basically we work here in the UK. Through roughly 20 slides of the marketing background, so no technology until slide 30, I think. So this is a whole story of marketing in one slide. So marketing evolved in the last 60, 70 years from a very low resolution approach to a high resolution approach or higher resolution approaches. So we started with mass marketing. So it's one message for everybody. Um, People didn't talk about segmentation at that point in time. Basically, there is only one segment, and that is the whole market. And I'm the marketeer, and I have a single product and a single message to share with everybody. So it's like you know, seeing the, the world in black and white. In, a number of years later, brand management appeared, and segmentation appeared. So this idea of dividing people based on demographics, social demographics, psychographics. Um, so trying to understand what is the right, the right message for each one of those. Now, as a marketeer, you can only handle six or ten segments, right? Because you need to produce six different messages, six different marketing campaigns. Um, so that's a medium resolution approach. And, and then CRM appeared as well, uh, which is one-to-one, -one, but fairly focused on business-to-business, -business, right? Not really into consumers. I'm going to speak about marketing to consumers. So in the last um, in the last 10 years internet mobile social networking have changed absolutely everything in terms of consumer so the way you consume stuff is completely different before you will go to the store nowadays you go to a store with your iPhone and, and you compare the prices of what you're looking there in Amazon and eBay and pro possibly you go there you touch the machine and say yeah this is the machine they want but you're not buying there you're buying on the phone um, so as people we are increasingly more complex and we have higher expectations um, um, in, in terms of what we want from brands. So A, the first one uh, thing that we want to do is we want to avoid having content pushed to us, right? We want a, an experience that is holistic. I don't want to have this idea, this has happened 20 years ago or 10 years ago, when I go to the bank, I see, I see my bank account and it says I have 1,000 pounds, then I go to the ATM and it says I have 500, and then I go and call the call center, they don't know, you know what my balance is. Right, so that goes against the brand experience. Customization, we, want if, we now understand that if you can have my data, we really want you to tailor everything that you do 
for me, right? I want a, a message that is tailored to me. I want a product that is tailored to me. Um, so these, these, these consumers are increasingly complex, and nowadays they connect to each other. Now, the, the, the um, velocity that these people have uh, and we have in terms of spreading messages is much faster than the marketeer, right? The marketeer is still using old technology to spread messages. Yeah, they can jump into your network and they can do some of that. But again, we are against that. As, as human beings, we are increasingly um, um, putting firewalls to, to protect us from, from, from that marketing approach. Um, so we are more powerful than ever before. Um, and this, what, what happened is that word of mouth has become the most trusted form of advertising. For the last 10 years, all the marketing research has, tell, has been telling this, right? So the best advertising is us, us spreading the word. So in the last 10 years, while working for this company, we developed something we call consumer engagement, which is a different approach to marketing. Instead of pushing content, what about pulling? So what, how am I going to do for the, for the consumer to come to my brand? Um, and, and there are a number of uh, key, key, um, key elements to be able to do that, but the main one is to use game mechanics, to use mechanics. And that changes everything in terms of platform because now my business logic is getting more complex. This is not just about filling in the form and having a, somebody in the database and then doing some analytics and push an email. Now I need to have different mechani mechanics for different people. When you think about mechanics, you can think about loyalty programs, member get a member, ruffles, instant wins, but all of them combined together, right? We built that 10 years ago um, very successfully. We tripled a brand in, in Latin America by doing that. And we handled Farrell. We're going to see Mary Farrell throughout the slides. And, and I have data that I collected from Mary Farrell. Um, that's in my internal DB. But I have Facebook profiles. I have a Twitter profile. And obviously what happens here is we start to see the variety, right? So... I don't define those data models. In, in, my, in my previous world, I, I own the data model, right? And I can move from transactional databases to data warehousing to whatever big data technology you want because I own all of that. And it's easy to move from, from, from one box to the other. In this case, I don't own the models. And there might be hundreds of them. So the traditional technology is starting to fall apart when you try to do that. So ETL, how I do ETL? Right, the extract, transform, and load to gather information from one store and put that into a 360-degree view of the consumer. And that's big data. And everybody talks about big data. And, 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 and they, when they talk about big data, they talk about these three things. Right? And we all understand that. We're going to see that we think this is incomplete. And it's and based on 10 years of doing, of doing consumer analytics. But the one thing that is very important, and has been important, we understood this you know, 15 years ago, actually, and we've been blessed by this, is data itself is not the asset. The asset is being able to execute. What I want as a marketeer is to be able to interact with this consumer. Whether I need data or not, I don't care. If I could do it without data, yeah, I, I would be the happier. So actionable knowledge is what we're after, right? And what is actionable knowledge is very simple. You know, act, something is actionable if I can act, right? Um, but people start talking about now about action, actionable knowledge, and we're going to give you a twist about that. So intelligent data analysis is the quest for actionable knowledge. You can replace that and say big data analytics, if you want, um, or data mining, or knowledge, or database discovery. Um, but that is what we want to do, right? So every time we do analytics, we are after actionable knowledge. Because if what we're after is something that is not actionable, then is, there is no purpose, right? There is no business value in it. Now, how we do that usually, right? And this is actually based on an ideal architecture that we came out um, a number of years ago. And we said, in, in all this marketing interaction, there are two main loops. The first one is the interaction loop, or the execution loop, or the automation loop is an autonomic controller, right? I should be able, because I want to engage hundreds of millions of people, I should be able to have a machine that I provide rules to and the machine thinks, right? Because I cannot do that with people. If, I need to inter if I'm Coca-Cola I need to interact with 100 million people, how do I do that? I cannot have 10 million people in the call center, right? Or 1 million marketeers. I need to be able to delegate that to, to, to the machine. Um, 
And on the other hand, I have the learning loop. You can call it the big data loop, right? So every event that happens, every click that the consumer does, every thing that he says in Twitter, every thing that he says um, uh, through all my communication channels should go into the two loops. It goes into the first one because I need a reaction from me. And it goes into the second one because I want to learn. If this is something I already knew about, then there is nothing to do. If this is something new, some new pattern arising from that, I need to transform that into something that I can push back into the automation loop. Now, what is the issue? Well, we start talking about technology, and we, yeah, we can put a data warehouse here. In, in, the, in, in the implementation that we did, we were using uh, a very well-known data warehousing technologies and, and BI tools. And nowadays, you can do Hadoop if you want. Um, but the thing is, every time I derive new knowledge, new knowledge is going to be a combination of new attributes that I need to start collecting or defining, and new rules. And therefore, I go into design time. I need to call a DBA so that I can start shaping the data model. right? And you can see how it goes. Then I need to tell the guy that is behind the rules to create a new rule. And then, by the way, there is a mapping between the rules and the database, and there is a mapping between the Java code in between and the database. So I have ORMs, I have rules or rule-based uh, engines, and suddenly I end up with six or seven different serverware middleware, right? And if you look at that, and, th and that is part of the keynote today, basically what you have is accidental complexity. I didn't want all of that. What I wanted is simple two loops. I want an event to go into one loop if there is something new, I inject a new rule into the other one, and the other one simply executes based on he, what he knows. But the problem with actionable knowledge is that actionable is an extrinsic quality attribute. So knowledge or data is not actionable per se. I need somebody or something to act upon it. And in order to execute this kind of marketing, what we need is a combination of different quality attributes as well. Um, and I'm not going to have a slide on the CAP theorem, but the CAP theorem is behind this, right? So I have scalability issues, I have consistency issues, omni-channel brand experience. So if I have 10 different channels in which, or touch points in which the consumer is going to interact with me, how I ensure that every, everything I say is the same? is always on, right? If, if you are on a store and you spend one hour customizing a shoe for your son, you don't expect the shopping cart to fail, but it does and you will never return, as I did. Um, and then you want real-time decisioning. The loop, the automation loop, should be in real-time because we are expecting real-time. And by real-time, I mean soft real-time, so less than 450 milliseconds, blink of an eye. Um, and then you have highly connected data. So this is not the normal data set anymore. I have social networks, and I need to be able to use that. Now, all the traditional technologies are very bad at managing relationships. And finally, I needed, as a marketeer, plasticity and agility, right? And the plasticity means agility we touched on the keynote, right, is being able to move quickly, right, the, the lead time to market, lead time to value. But plasticity is another one that, is, that has been puzzling us for ages, and it's to be able to easily mold this thing, to be able to easily change. Now, if all my business logic, if all my marketing logic is spread out in Java code in 1,000 classes, what is the business logic? How can I manage that? And that happened to us. So where is the discount? Well, the discount is spread out in 10, 10 different classes because it might come because of this, it might come because of that. What I wanted to, to be able to do is to have all the business logic print out in a single page so I can understand as a marketer what's going on. So that is what happens with the marketing technology today. They lack this capability to execute. So we need to reduce the complexity in this chart. And that's what we set up to do. And we said what we need is big data, yeah, but we need big logic. We need... <clears throat> so my information model needs to go and follow that. Um, and it needs to be relational. Now people, interestingly, they think that relational technology is SQL. And it's, it's nothing uh, uh, you know, far, far from that. Um, even there are some technologies that are, um, that are relational and they say they are not relational because they want to separate themselves from, 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 from SQL databases. So we need relational because relational is a way of composing 
deriving data out of data, right? And we need functions, right? So we need a functional approach that we can apply to data to derive new data. That's what you, you typically, you know, if, if you follow some, some of these uh, topics, um, you must have heard about intentional or derived relations or views in databases, right? Now, there, there is a paper uh, called Out of the Top, which introduced something called function relation programming that was in 2006. I've got the keynote from the guy who disappeared. He's, he's no longer online. I've got it. He's not working on my keynote because there are no versions. If anybody wants that, the paper is still online. And, and this paper um, inspired the guys from uh, Closure and, 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 and Rich Hickey to develop Datomic. And it inspired us as well. And what, I'm, what you're going to see is very similar in, in, in that approach, but with a different focus. So SQL tables, we've done that. No, it didn't work. It's, it's, too, it's too cumbersome. You know, we need to change those tables or fix tables. Key value is not relational. Documents, not relational. Objects, yeah, we thought about it, you know, but it's too complex. Again, it's not flat, right? Object-oriented graphs. Again, the, the object-oriented graphs, I call object-oriented graphs a near for j for example. Um, that was our first idea, and we really um, uh, thought about it, but then we realized, no, we need to stick with that design. This needs to be flat, right? If I can start populating properties all over the place, how can I compose things easily? So the two um, final ideas is ent entity attribute value, which is what Datomic Closure is using, or RDF which is a results description framework, semantic web language to connect data. So let's take a look at entity attribute value. So if I wanted to make the world flat, I need to go down to the smallest information component or atom. And that is EAV that was invented even before relational databases. So if I have an entity that I call 123 and then have attributes and values. So each one of those rows is a cell in a relational database, right? So in a relational database, I will have the consumer table with 50 rows. The first row will be first name, the second row will be married, and the third row will be date of birth. What we're doing here is we're flattening out that table and saying, no, we want the cells. So there is a single table called EAV, and I can define everything that I can define in SQL in EAV. But before we said, we need to marry those two loops. But we also need to marry the web, because the web is a database. So if the web is a database, why don't we consider RDF? An RDF is like EAV, with a minor twist. This is not a V, this is not a value, it's an object. So what goes as a subject can also go as an object, right? So again, this is the same thing. The weird thing about, obviously, RDF is that it uses XSD values. Um, so everything is a string, but it's a type string as a value. And everything is represented by, every entity is represented by URIs or URLs if you want. Right, so, but that's not enough, right? So we had um, this, this requirement to gather the information from many different sources. Is somebody listen to me? No, no. <laughs> not sure. No worries. Um, what I've less, at least it's not um, my, my music, uh, which, which it would be more in the metal side of things. Uh. <laughs> so um, we need to gather information from multiple sources, right? So we need namespaces. Now, RDF quads are uh, that thing. So if I, if I add another column, I can define, well, I got this data. Um, or this data is for a consumer profile, but this data is from Facebook, right? So now I have a very simple um, and interesting model in which I can gather any, any type of data and, and, uh, and integrate it. So the other thing, and we share, and we share that with, uh, with uh, thank you, we share that with, um, with Datomic is facts are immutable. But we learned this not because of the philosophical approach that Rich Hickey has, which is brilliant, but we learned this because we were marketeers. And as marketeers, we need to remember everything, because otherwise we're going to draw wrong conclusions, right? So we needed to have facts that are immutable. 
So these records that we're talking about should be immutable. And one more thing. We learned two other things. Big data is not just volume, velocity, and variety. It's also veracity and validity. Veracity, if I'm gathering information from multiple sources, what I'm going to have is incomplete information, contradictory information, and by the way, as consumers, we lie. Right? And as a marketeer, I want to know that. And I want to know which one is a lie and which one is not. And then is validity, right? So I am married. Well, for how long? Right? So how, how am I going to structure all those life-changing events which are key for making a, 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 an understanding of, of a person into a model? Now, I'm, not going to, I'm, I'm going to try and tackle veracity in what I'm going to show you next. I'm not going to tackle validity. Uh, because of some constraints that I'm going to show you, but it's, it's, our, it's, it's, it's part of the challenge as well. So we end up with this. This is how our information model should look like. So I have a subject break an object, that's an RDF triple. I have a graph, so I can have a namespace for each data, each fact that I'm recording. I have a probability degree, or veracity degree, or certainty degree, or whatever you like to call it. And it's something between zero and one. So it's a weight of this fact. And then I have a transaction ID or a timestamp telling you when this was recorded. And this is why I say I'm not tackling the validity because I'm not saying from when to when this is valid. But it's something that we can do and we didn't do it so far because it's too expensive. But basically this also allows you to do temporal queries. I can go back in time and say, tell me everything about Mary on Monday or tell me everything I know about Mary today. And this is also a graph. So we decided to create LeapSight Semantic Data Space, um, or LSD, uh, which play nice with this idea of those marketing on acid. We've been dreaming about this. We've been doing sort of EAV back in 2003. Um, then I, I, you know, I came here. I didn't code for six years, but you know, this idea was still there. We've, I've been trying to do something with RDF and Semantic Web since 96 which tells my age. But, um, so what is, what is this? This is an in-memory distributed scalable, highly available, fault around, directed, blah, 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 semantic database, right? So I'm going to go through that. So the record, how we, how we store information, you've already seen the table. This is an Erlang representation. This is built in Erlang and a library of C. <clears throat> so the database is, uh, is immutable, um, or is, is the database of immutable temporal and probabilistic facts. So basically, I record a subject. The subject, these are the types. I'm not going to go into that because you, um, you're going to be bored to death. But basically, subject is either a URI or an anonymous ID. Um, a predicate is always a URI. So a predicate is actually an entity, right? So I can talk about a predicate. I can say a predicate is a, pre a, a, a property and is a subclass of this other property. And I go into the uh, ontology web languages. Um, an object is anything, right? It's not only a URI or an anonymous ID. It can also be a literal. And a literal is a string with attached metadata or not. And a graph is another URI denoting a logical partition of the data. The transaction ID is going to be a 128-bit conflict-free um, K-order identifier. This is something that um, it was created by Twitter but then adopted by a company called Boundary, and, and is, the project is called Flake. Um, so basically, that gives us a unique, universal unique ID based on a timestamp. Um, finally, the degree is a float between 0 and 1, denoting your certainty, your weight, your. And we have another one, which I haven't shown you before, which is a type, because I want to be able to define what is stored in the database as opposed to what I've generated on the fly. It's not acid. Um, is it, it is eventually consistent, right? It's an append-only store. Now, we haven't, um, the, the, the way we've, we do this is, is an append-only store is a set of these statements. And by the way we're doing it, it, it really approximates a committed replicated data, um, uh, data type it's, and a set. Uh, we haven't proven that yet. And there are some corner cases that we require more work. But basically, we're going towards strong consistency 
or stronger consistency, uh, uh, eventually consistency model. It is relational, uh, but, but it's not secure. So I can apply relational algebra to these structures. I can apply relational algebra to EAV, and that is exactly what the atomic does. Um, <clears throat> and we use a declarative query language based on data log, same as atomic, because it's relational. Data log, I'm going to touch on that, and I'm going to show you a little bit of a demo. So written in Erlang, we use Basha React Core as our platform. We spend six months, uh, re re I don't know if you know, well, you, you probably know Basho React um, KV, the key value store. Um, KV is built on React Core. React Core is a generalization of the Dynamo, Amazon's Dynamo architecture. Uh, basically what is behind every NoSQL database out there. So Cassandra, MongoDB, all of them are following Dynamo. Um, now we spent six months building our own Dynamo until we realized that React Core was open source and public and we threw away everything we've done. Um, so it, it talks about the quality of what the Basho guys have did with React Core. Um, we got an Erlang client, we have RESTful API services. We have binary services using BERT, which is basically Erlang serialization, and we do that because we want to um, avoid paying the tax on uh, the Erlang side of things in, in terms of serialization, and we're working on a Java client on top of BERT at the moment. So how you use this thing? So you have a cluster, and this is a very simple, simple diagram. I'm going to give you the complex one um, in a couple of slides. So you have a cluster of these things. Uh, you can scale out. Uh, all nodes are equal. Um, I store data indices on that, and I can have rule-based reasoning on top of that. And every time I query, I'm querying either directly the database or the data or the indices or going through rules. This is a more complex one. So this is how React Core structures things. So everything that is surrounded by a yellow box is um, a pattern implemented by React Core. So React Core is a distributed computing platform. It gives you consistency hashing, hinted handoff, um, gossip to um, synchronize the state of the cluster with, with all the nodes, because all the nodes are equal. There is no special node. Um, it has anti-entropy, so when you're replicating data, you're going to have inconsistencies. So React Core gives you passive and active anti-entropy. Active anti-entropy is a number of processes working and synchronizing, making sure that the replicas are in sync. And passive anti-entropy happens when you do a read, and if there is a conflict, you might be able to resolve it. Now, <clears throat> and they manage, obviously, node liveness. Now, the interesting thing about React Core is that, obviously, these machines might fail. So what they thought about, and this is part of Dynamo as well, is they thought about establishing another layer of indirection. So you have V nodes as opposed to nodes. So all that, you structure all your, in, in our case, our database is a collection of mini databases called V nodes. Now the V nodes move between physical nodes. So if one machine goes down, all these four V nodes will be relocated. And that is React Core doing all the work for you. Now on top of that, you need to be able to do requests, handle requests. So we implement that as uh, finished state machines in Erlang. <clears throat> and on top of that, so that is for a typical API that I'm going to show you, read, write, remove. On top of that, we have the data log coordinator, which is responsible to pass your data log rules and queries and go through um, the request coordinators to get the data. And on top, you have the local client, the embedded client. I'm going to show you the, the embedded client in Erlang in a moment. <clears throat> and finally, we expose that through, uh, through API services. So we touched on, on React Core. I'm not going to go into, into, into more detail there. Uh, basically, it's, it's a muscle of decentralized, as I've, as I've told you. All nodes are equal. Now, the interesting thing about um, consistency hashing that we're going to see is uh, how, how we use it. So a little bit of code. This is how we do um, distributed writes. So I write a statement written in many places, right? So that write is coordinating the write to, across all the replicas according to your parameters. You can, let's say that, that I define that I have three replicas. I can say I want the three to be consistent, otherwise give me an error. Does a three out of three. I want a quorum. I want two out of three for this to succeed, or I want one of three. Um, I can do an async write as well, and I get a promise. I can yield the promise later on. The same with the remove. Now, the remove is 
not, is, is actually a lie. There is no remove in the database. Um, so what you can do is actually um, flag a copy of this statement with a degree of zero. And that is basically saying this statement is no longer true in this moment in time. So we index the data and we, and we, we ship that into a maximum of six covering indices in different collation orders. So if you want to um, match, pattern match the data by graph and wildcards in SPO, then you use a GSPO. If you want to search all the data in all the graphs for a single person or entity, you, you go to SPOG and you will give me a value for S and wildcards for POG. But all of that is handled transparently for you. I'm going to go quickly. You know because it's in hashing probably, so nothing, nothing more interesting here. Now, the thing here is that um, every vnode obviously represents a partition in that ring. So that is every time you do it right, we're hashing the indices and shipping those to the right partition. I'm going to go quickly. Um, active anti-entropy, as we mentioned, is based on React Core. Uh, we do actually deviate from the way they, they do it because obviously they, do a, they, they have a key value store. What we do is every time you do a read, I'm sending you the data, but I'm also sending you a signature. The signature is a collection of all the transaction entities that this data have seen, right, including Tomstons. So in order to get this data from the three different replicas, I'm also saying which other transaction entity that I visited in order to come out with this answer. If those don't match, there is a difference in, there is, an, there, is, there is an issue, a consistent issue between the replicas, and you know that you can do something with it. How do we do reads? Um, we write patterns. So a pattern is a statement with wildcards and variables, right? And then I do a read, I send the pattern, and I get a result set. I can do a take. A take is a read followed by a remove. And this is from Java Spaces. If anybody's seen Java Spaces or Giga Spaces, this is their, um, their idea. So it allows you to do workflow kind of implementation. So you put something there in a queue, I take it. Async reads and async takes. Um, you can also define a transaction ID, and you're going to do a temporal query. So give me everything from last Monday, as we said before. And there is another comment that is a history comment that basically lists everything that you know about a statement, all the Thompsons, all the different versions that you've written. So every time I write a statement with the same degree, but different transaction ID, the store is not going to do anything. It's identical to that. But every time I write a new, uh, st the same statement with a different degree is a new version of that statement. Finally, I can do simple conditions and patterns, but in order to do more complex ones, we, we are implementing conjunctive queries at this level at the moment. So we, you will be able to do joins at this level, right? It is based on pattern matching. Yeah, take history, we, we touched on that. So the interesting thing is this one. So we needed to come out with a way of expressing rules. So we thought about. Um, basically using data log. Data log is a subset of Prolog, and if you combine with many extensions, it's a superset of CQL. So it's more expressive than CQL when it includes neg negation and function symbols and arithmetic comparisons. Liblog is our implementation of that. So it is the declarative logic programming and query language based on data log but adapted to the RDF data values. Uh, you can make deductions based on the rules expressing libblog. It works top down. The difference with uh, prolog, if you use prolog, it works one tuple of a time. We cannot do that. We need to work a set at a time. There is a number of, a family of algorithms known as query sub query that actually do that. There are a number of other algorithms to, to obviously implement data log. But we decided to go to, um, uh, for, for QSQ. And in particular, we're using one that uses a data flow network to represent the. Uh, the execution of the, of the algorithm. We added built-in protocols and function symbols. We haven't got aggregates. We're going to add aggregates, and we haven't got negation yet. Now, solving negation and aggregates is more or less the same. So the solution for both is the same. So that's what we are about to do. So this is the syntax of libload. So what I'm doing there is um, reflecting an, a piece of code that is going to help me define the uh, gang of four in Erlang, the creators of Erlang. 
So I'm going to say that a subject one is a colleague of a subject two if and only if both created the same product and both are not the same. That's the first rule. The second rule says subject two is a colleague of subject one if subject one is a colleague of subject two and they're not equal. The third one says they know each other if they're colleagues, right? And if I know you, you know me, is a reflexive property. Now, if in the next stage, if I'm using ontologies, I can actually go and define a, a in, in, in ontology web language, I can say knows is a reflexive property. So it will drive that for you. So because we're just about to finish, let's quickly do a demo. And this is where everything can go wrong. And, it, and, and I'm, you know, and usually it, it happens with me, so. Yeah. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create um, a client in order to connect. I'm going to define a table, a table, a function, an anonymous function that is going to help me printing out some of the results. I'm going to use a prefix mapping because URIs are very long. What we're going to do is map short keys to URIs. These are called prefixes in, um, in RDF and, and web technologies, right? Um, I'm going to set I'm going to set a prefix saying URL equals to erlang.org, right? So now instead of writing HTTP erlang.org slash whatever, I'm going to do URL as a prefix, another URI. And obviously each one of them is another URI. I can use, obviously I can use whatever scheme you want. I'm going to write that now. And here what I receive is a context saying, yeah, in this case is, is the first write, so I initiate that. I'm going to do the write again. So it's five milliseconds. And obviously, I'm in a single machine. I'm running 64 V nodes in a single machine. Um, all of that in memory. And this is a transaction ID. It's now, I'm going to create a pattern. Right? So that pattern is going to say, bring me from code mesh demo graph anybody who's a creator of anything. And I want to bind that to two variables. And now I'm going to do a read. Right. So I read with the, with the pattern, and I got back the four statements that I've written. Now I'm going to do another pattern that is not going to work, because I'm going to read who knows who. But nobody knows anybody. What I've just written is, this guy's created airline. So what I'm going to do now, and I'm going to go quickly because we haven't got enough time. I'm going to define a rule set, which is a rule set that you've just seen in the presentation, right? This one. That's a rule set. That's a piece of string. Now I'm going to do this. I'm going to say, I'm going to do a query. I'm going to show you the query here. Sorry. So these are the queries. This is the rule set that I've just created. And these are the, the queries that I can do. So for example, give me who is, who is a colleague of who. Now, there is no data defining colleague. There is a rule defining colleague. So colleague is going to be a derived uh, property. So I'm going to say now, who is colleague of who? I'm going to use a prefix mapping that I've said before because I want to use short uh, URLs there. And there you are. So what we got there is that um, Claes no, uh, well, is a colleague of Joe, Claes is, is a colleague of Mike, Claes is a colleague of Robert, and so on and so forth. Right? So what I'm doing here is using the rule to derive the data. Now, I can actually go there and say now, who knows who, right? And 
again, if you go back to the rule, knows is a direct relationship based on colleague. Colleague is a direct relationship based on creator. Creator is the only extensional property or extensional fact, meaning is the only thing that I've stored in the database. Everything else doesn't exist. I'm deriving in real time. Finally, I can do something like, who is Joe Armstrong? And the only thing I've written in the database is Joe created Erlang. But now I know, he kn he, he's a colleague of all these guys, and he knows all these guys. Right? So, final slide. That is for anyone interested in how we do that. So we write this query language uh, as a string. We pass that. We generate an, an abstract syntax tree. We optimize it. We're using plenty of optimizations that you can find in, in all the books. And I'm going to show you the book, the Bible. If you want to replicate this, you can do it. It will take you two or three years. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and you need a decent wife and lovely children to be able to, to support you. Um, now, we, when we execute, um, at, at the moment, we have a, a single monolithic uh, coordinator doing, doing that. But it, de it delegates to the request um, to different vnodes for the small requests. What we're, what we're doing now is that we can identify complex queries within your rules, but those complex queries can be directly implemented in the vNode. We call them conjunctive queries. There are many definitions of conjunctive queries. For us, a conjunctive query is a joint query exclusively based on extensional data, so data that is stored in the database, so no rules. So when you give me the rule set, I will optimize them and will find within each one of your uh, joins, which part of the join I can ship to a vNode, and I will do that in parallel. And if you want to go through this, these are the two books that you need. And from here, you need to read roughly 2,000 papers, uh, which is what we read. Um, and you probably need to study 10 very well. And, and you need to understand a little bit, more, a little bit about hypergraphs. I need, I, uh, we, in particular, myself, I, I, I knew nothing about it. I spent a month learning about hypergraphs, things like acyclic hypergraph algorithms, GYO reduction, um, hypertree decomposition of hypergraphs. All of that we have implemented in, in Erlang to be able to, to do this. Um, if anyone is interested in um, the actual list, which I couldn't print in this presentation, happy to, happy to go through that. Um, there are plenty more books that we've, uh, that we've recovered from, uh, from uh, libraries that are invaluable in, in order to understand how to do something like this. So. Thank you. That's time. So what I want to do is every time I do the query, I, I should be able to give you another, another set of rules. Why? Because I want to do multivariate testing. I want to test multiple rules, right? You, you, you must have heard about AB split analysis. Well, M MVT is multivariate. So multivariables in the AB, right? Multi-ABs altogether. So if I can combine, what is the price that I'm going to offer you? What is the message that I'm going to offer? What is the right promotion? What is the right product? And I have different rules to define that. I can test by doing run rubbing. You know, everybody that hits the web server, I impact with a different rule. You can store the rules. And if you store the rules, uh, we can compile them and optimize them. Otherwise, you can provide me the string as, as it's just it. Cool. Yeah. Do you have to deal with corrections? So, like, say, if you discover one of them actually wasn't a colleague or sorry, wasn't a creator and made mistakes, because you're logging everything, aren't you? Yeah. And so, when you're reading that, like, how do you handle corrections? So, um, so it depends if it is an extension um, relation, a statement that I store in a database, or is a statement that I'm deriving. If it is a statement that I'm stored, I can mess around with the degree. So basically, if I learn that I'm not sure that you are married, uh, what I will go there and say, well, because, because something happened with you and the brand that, you know, so some interaction show me that you're, you're saying one thing on, on one data set and, and you're saying another thing on one, another data set. What I can do is have an algorithm that visits all of that and say, well, from now on, 
the degree of trust that I have on this triple is no 100%, is 50%. And what I haven't shown you in all the queries, I can express degrees. So I can say, give me all the colleagues as long as the confident degree is more than 50%. What is the next step, which is the other answer to the question, is what about the derived data? So for that, we need to implement um, base um, algorithms on the data log engine itself so that I can create and compose probabilities. Now, the probability of one fact and another fact is not just a, the multiplication of that. It's more subtle, right, because one might cost the other one. So what is it? if they're, they're independent, there is a straightforward computation of that. If it is not independent, you need to resort to base networks or you know, markup chains or stuff like that, uh, which is you know, something I don't understand yet. But, uh, <laughs> but part of the team do. So basically, we need, to, we need to move into that direction. But if you're storing the data, you just play with the degrees. right? And you can always combine time and degrees in every query. And when I, when I do a query by degree, it's always a uh, greater or, 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 or equal than. So if I say, give me everything that is 0 0.5 degree, it means give me everything that is above 0 0.5 degree. Okay? And the uh, Liblock language supports that as well in the syntax. Can those degrees be changed? Yes. And every time you change, it's a new version of the statement. And, and the old one? Remains there. Yeah. Now, because it's in memory, we're going to do archiving. We do an archiving process. And we go back to disk. You need to find what is the window of time that you, that, that you want, of, what is the history window of time that you want in memory, obviously. Uh, but you cannot change a statement. What you can do is write it with a different degree, which is another statement. And if you want to change the subject predicate object, it's another statement. So RDF is itself an immutable model, and we are just following that. Thank you very much, guys.